My father was very no nonsense, pragmatic, ghosts don't exist kind of guy. He briefly served in the army back in the mid 70s as a rescue and recovery specialist, or as he put it, simply motorpool. The story he shared with me one night while we were out fishing. He had been in Gettysburg as he was a bit of a history buff and wanted to visit some places before settling down, marrying and having kids. As he lay there in bed at night, it was 1am or so, and he was a very heavy sleeper. I witnessed this man legitimately sleep through a thunderstorm that flooded most of our downtown area. I've seen him sleep through a tree crashing down next to our tent on a camping trip, and this man would not budge. Back to my main story. He had been sleeping somewhere in or near Gettysburg and had woken up in the dead middle of the night feeling like he was being watched. As he glanced around the room, nothing really seemed out of the ordinary until he heard footsteps in the room. He didn't really give us an idea as to what they specifically sounded like. But as he's laying in bed, he hears footsteps and then watches as the mattress near his feet compresses as if someone's sitting there. But there's nothing there. No silhouette, no body, just a depression in the mattress. As far as I remember, he was alone during this event. He didn't really freak out or lose his mind or anything like that, but he told me that this particular event made him believe just a little bit more in the unexplainable. I used to work at a fast food restaurant and would do the graveyard shift every weekend. After every shift at 5am, I would walk to the train station and catch the train home. Usually by then, there are your typical drunk people and morning crazies. Usually I'd sit on the first seat of the train so that I can take a moderately comfortable nap on my one hour journey home. But that day, I wasn't super tired and decided to take a window seat to watch the sunrise. After a while, I noticed a guy sitting behind me talking to himself. So I had turned off my music to listen to what he was saying. I always do this because I listen to a lot of crime podcasts. Not that anything usually happens. In the beginning, I could hardly hear what he was saying. But as the train ride went on, the louder he got, Halfway through, I heard him say, the girl's ignoring me. And with that, I assumed he was talking about someone he was texting or something. But then I could hear a creaking of the seat as he moved forward, right up next to my ear and said, you look pretty. All I could do was turn my head and look out the window while humming a tune, pretending that my music was still on. After that, he leaned back into his seat and kept cussing me out. It was getting closer to my stop, and I was getting increasingly worried as this man hadn't stopped cussing me out since he leaned back in his seat. I decided to go on with my normal routine of calling my mum so that she could get me from the train station. Since I speak another language, it was easy for me to explain what had happened and to ask if she could hurry so that she would be there in time for my train. There was just one stop left before mine, and the man was still on the seat behind me, but he had become increasingly more aggressive that I had ignored him, and this time, he was saying things like, she has pretty fingers. I can't wait to get her off the train, and I'll teach you not to ignore me. I had truly hoped that he would have gotten off at the stop before mine, but that didn't happen. We pulled into the station, which was the final one on the line. I slowly gathered my things and started to get up as the doors all opened. I made the mistake of glancing back at me as I was getting off and saw the man holding massive bolt cutters. As soon as he saw me, he yelled, I'll cut your fingers off and began to chase after me. Luckily, as soon as I ran up the stairs, the man had stopped the chase to catch his breath. I ran across the platforms and saw the man once again. He pointed and laughed. So to the guy with the red bolt cutters who wanted my fingers, 
let's not meet again. This is actually my friend's story, but I trust them and they seemed visibly shaken up by what happened. After we graduated high school, we went on a trip to Samui, which is an island in Thailand. And during the day, we would mess around while waiting to go out at night. We rented motorcycles, rode around the island, but on that day, this happened. I was too lazy to go out, so I stayed behind with some other friends. When they got back, they told us about how they eventually got a bit hungry and lost, and that they stumbled upon some old lady by the road. They asked her directions to anywhere they could grab food, and all she did was point them in the direction of the road. They said thanks, and rode on that way until they got to what looked like a hotel and restaurant. They were greeted by reception and directed towards the restaurant. The place seemed perfectly fine, but as they explored the place, they noticed something was off. It was completely empty. It looked like it was abandoned, even though when they got there, it seemed to be in perfect condition. They got out of there as fast as possible, and when they met other locals and asked them about that place, they said that it had been closed for years. These friends of mine are the adventurous type, but they looked disturbed when they returned back to the hotel. This happened back in the 90s, when I was still in primary school. So I really had no clue how much danger I was in. I would have been around 11, living in a regional city of Australia. For the last year, I had been having a lot of trouble at school, getting bullied a bit by classmates and felt really singled out by my teacher. My mom worked around the corner from my school. So when everything would get too much at school, I would literally just walk out of class down the road and onto her work site. It would take me about half an hour to walk there along a main road. A few times I noticed a small white car drive past me slowly, but I only noticed this because I would see the same car go up and down the street as I was walking and while I was sitting outside of my mum's work site. After a while, I started seeing the same car driving up my street at home and parked along the streets that my brother and I would ride our bikes around in. I didn't usually see the same cars and people. It was just like, oh, there goes that car again. My family followed a serious routine. Mondays, swimming and tutoring. Tuesdays, netball training. Wednesday, netball game. Thursday, basketball training. Fridays, we would go and see professional basketball or football, depending on the season. Saturday was my brother's basketball games, and Sunday were our days to go to the rivers with friends or swims, or barbecue lunch. It never changed unless someone was sick. So on Friday night, I'm dressed and ready to go watch the basketball game, but I can't find my shoes. I'm pretty sure that they're in the car, which is in a garage under our two-story house. To get it, I have to walk down the outside steps at the front of our house, which has a full view of the road. I walk out the front door. At the end of our driveway, I notice a small white car. Now I've never taken that much notice of the white cars up until this point. And it wasn't uncommon for cars to park in this exact spot for our neighbor. But I just got a sinking feeling in my stomach when I looked at it. I kept walking down the stairs and as I got close to the bottom, the driver's side door opens and a man gets out quickly. I keep walking towards the garage and he starts moving towards our driveway. That was the point when something inside me told me to scream for my parents and run and lock myself in the car. I did exactly that. And this guy who was halfway up my driveway at this point turned around and ran back to his car and drove off. By the time my parents came out, there was no evidence that this had happened and they didn't believe me. A week later, there was a notice in our school newsletter about a man in a white car attempting to take another child from my school at the same night. My parents were very shaken and took me seriously after reading that. I don't believe he was ever caught, but it definitely taught me to listen to my intuition and take notice of my surroundings. When I was five, 
Me and my identical twin sister both caught scarlet fever. We are from America. But my dad's project had temporarily relocated us to India. And we were not used to the water and food there. We both fell into a coma towards the end of the fever. One day, I woke up. And my mum and aunt were screaming and crying and holding my sister because she was unresponsive and not breathing. They were doing chest compressions, CPR and the like, but nothing was working. I was desperately trying to get their attention because I was young and didn't understand what was going on. I went back to my room to go back to sleep. But in the corner of my room where my sister's bed was, I saw her laying there breathing fine. I went back out to the living room and realized I was looking at myself in my mum's arms as she tried to revive me. Eventually, I saw my eyes flicker open. And then everything went dark. I woke up a few weeks later in the hospital next to my sister and my mum, who ended up catching it because of us. My mum told me I had almost passed. And they were trying to wake me up, but I was unresponsive. So the ambulance took all three of us into the ICU. To this day, I'm still unsure how I witnessed my almost death. I was waiting at the train station to pick up a friend of mine. I was early, so I decided to stand in the sun right outside of the station. A guy with a bicycle walked up to me asking in broken English if he knew how late the train would arrive. After I answered the question, he stayed around and started talking to me. Now I know that's not at all weird, but the things he would ask me and the way he acted just gave me a creepy vibe. Eventually, he asked me if I would walk with him while he dropped his bicycle off. I didn't want to because the place to store bicycles at the station is very secluded. And to be honest, I didn't want to be alone with the guy. So I noped out and walked into the station. He started yelling at me, calling me names, but at that moment, the train came in and it got very busy, so he left. A few months later, I read this article in the local paper about girls being abused at the station. They had put a drawing of that guy next to the article as he was not yet caught. It was the same guy. To this day, I'm very, very happy I didn't go with him because the outcome would have been horrific. This happened during my holiday this past Christmas. I went on a family holiday with my dad, mum and brother to Tasmania, which is kind of like a big island to the south of Australia. I wasn't incredibly interested in the trip. I just wanted to spend time with my family. So I left all the bookings to my dad and I never will again. He has his own Airbnb he manages so I thought he would be able to find a decent place on his own. When we rocked up to the Airbnb my dad booked, the first thought I had was, if I wanted to sell drugs, I would do it here. My mom was not impressed at all and was already telling my dad off for booking it. I didn't say anything. Perhaps the inside is nicer. It was a little dingy house, the paint was peeling off, the roof was rusty, and there were plants overgrown to this side of the building. Imagine grown into the actual foundation and wooden planks. There were three entrances. The first one I worked out was the entrance for the host. It looked okay, not as bad as our entrance, a little tidier. I went downstairs, so we figured out after a while, the host most likely lived below us. The second looked like it was the main entrance to the house, but it was sealed shut. The door looked like it would break down if anyone was to even push on it slightly and was obviously unused. The third was ours. Aside from the overgrown plants, it was fairly normal. From the looks of it, we figured out later on, it looked like the host had divided the house up somehow. She lives below, we live upstairs, but there was one half of the house upstairs that wasn't accounted for. It's hard to explain, but the space we occupied only accounted for half the house and only went up to the main entrance I spoke of, 
which is in the middle of the house. We checked in, which equated to grabbing the keys. The host had never contacted us at that point. All was well on the inside. It looked a little old, but wasn't creepy from the get-go. I did notice some odd things. I only mentioned this to my dad. There were a bunch of antique instruments displayed at the entrance, and right on the top of these, of the piano, were three things that looked like urns. Now to explain, I am of Chinese descent. These urns freaked the hell out of me and my guys. Some people think they're for display, but we use it to store ashes of the dead. So I really didn't like them being there. I told my dad and he didn't like it either, but he went and tapped the urn to see if there was something in it, but couldn't tell. But he mentioned that the one he tapped was definitely ones we used for ashes. It had scripts on it, like safe passage to the heavens from what I could make out. After I stopped freaking out, I went and picked first dibs on the biggest room as per my usual, but then noticed that there were heaps of mirrors around the room. Again, another thing, not sure if it's just a Chinese thing, but we don't like sleeping with mirrors facing us when we're in bed, if we can help it. So I went to move one of them, which was smack bang in front of the bed. It was leaning against a door. And when I took the mirror away, the door actually opened ajar a little. That freaked me out. I got my dad and we decided it's better. I slept with my mum in another room. And he later took this room with my brother. There was another room, but we didn't use that. Again, my dad, being dad, opened the doors a little and shouted, Hello, before I told him to shut up. I had a peek inside, but couldn't make out much, only that it was dusty, and seemed to be part of the other half of the house. My dad soon put a chair and suitcase on top of it, in front of the door to keep it shut. Fast forward to that night, everyone is sleepy and went ahead to bed. I stayed up a little because I had some emails from work to catch up on and went to work in the living room area. At one point around 11.30 PM, I remember there were a few thumps on the roof, sounded almost like footsteps, then followed by the loudest, most horrendous noise. It sounded like a train was on top of me. It was screeching like steel on steel and lasted maybe 30 seconds. I literally froze at that point. I didn't know what to do. I thought my dad would come and check on me, but no one ever did. I didn't say anything the next morning because I thought I may have imagined it out of tiredness. The following night, the same thing again, except I was in bed this time. I just got to it, so not asleep yet. It was around the same time that the exact same noise started up again. My mom woke up, but was frozen like me. Dad came to check on us and we were all just frozen there listening to this noise, wondering what the hell it was. After it stopped, we were freaked out, but managed to shrug it off and went to sleep. Before I fell asleep, I remember hearing some faint thumps that stopped shortly after it started. The next morning, we kind of had a meeting of some sort to discuss this. This is when I told them of the night before. We were extremely unsettled at this point, and luckily it was checkout day. We just got the hell out of there and never found out what it was. The creepiest thing was after we packed up and left, and were well away from that place, dad was driving, but he still looked disturbed. So I asked him if he was okay. He said, I am now, but I didn't have a good light's sleep. I pressed on and asked him what it was. He said the noise didn't bother him much compared to what he experienced. What bothered him the most was when we left on our tour on the second day. He still had his suitcase on top of the chair blocking the door in his room. He showered, and he also left the towel on the chair to hang. He said when he came back, he noticed the door was slightly ajar. The chair had moved slightly and the towel was on the floor, as if someone tried to push it from the other side, but unsuccessfully after they noticed there was a lot of stuff on the other end. I forced him to ask the host about the noise in the door. She replied that the door was the door to her art room and the noise was just a possum on the roof. I don't believe her. The noise was not something an animal or even a human can make. Airbnb host, I hope we do not meet, like, ever. As a kid growing up, 
I lived in a pretty secluded neighborhood where my bus would drop me off from school. I had to walk through a small wooded area and a good distance down the road to get home. The houses were not close together and nobody was ever outside or anything. That led to some less than pleasant encounters with strange drivers. I remember a black car with tinted windows would occasionally visit while I was outside. They would speed at me and seemingly try to hit me, turn around and do it again. I had to hop a neighbor's fence twice to avoid being struck as they would even come up on the grass and skim the fence. I was too young to have any friends that drove at the time. So it wasn't one of them playing a messed up prank. I don't know why they did this, but I remember them coming down my street a few times as a kid, whenever I was in a yard and not on the street. They would just drive at cruel pace past me. Another time I was in middle school walking home. I did dress nice that day, but in my opinion, I definitely still looked like a child. A man in a faded red truck slowed and paced behind me. He rolled down his window and asked, Hey, are you broke down anywhere? You need a ride? I politely declined saying I didn't drive. Are you sure? I don't know why, but him asking if I was sure gave me a chill. I politely reaffirmed that I was in middle school and couldn't drive, which was probably a stupid thing to say. Kids are dumb. He still slowly paced me. Though we were both silent, it was probably only about 10 seconds, but every passing moment was increasingly heavy. I was right about to bolt when he drove off to the end of the street. I ran the rest of the way home, went inside and from my kitchen window, watched that same truck slowly drive down my street twice more. I told myself maybe he was just an awkward guy who was bad at picking up women, but why did he come down my street again twice after I got home? Why did he continue to pace me trying to pick up a woman who clearly looked like a school kid? Maybe he was debating on taking me. Maybe he really was just a strange person, though he gave a bad vibe from the start. I was more cautious walking home after this, but I never saw that guy again, thankfully. My sister and her best friend were chased by a man in a red truck when they were in elementary school, but I don't know if it was the same guy. Living in the middle of nowhere in the south, there's a ton of trucks everywhere. It was years before my encounter and the guy didn't chase me. But who knows? All I know is that there were some crazy people to go down to our neighborhood, and I wasn't the only one who experienced them. Since I can remember, my mum saw things that no one else could, a new thing she couldn't ever have known. I'm not sure if I could call her a medium. To my knowledge, she's never actually tried to communicate with the dead. My mum never really liked to talk about it. And whenever I tried to talk about these things, she would quickly change the subject. However, she did tell me the spirits she sees or senses are all around us and are mostly neutral. The few instances of an evil presence she encountered scared her so much, she hoped that none of her children would have the same ability. I'm definitely not as sensitive as my mother. However, I do have a few strange experiences of my own. Today, I would like to share them with you. At the time I was around 15 years old, I live in Poland with my parents and two younger siblings in an apartment on the fourth floor. There was this older lady with some kind of mental disability living in the neighborhood. I never saw her before that day. She probably seldom left the house. That afternoon, I was doing my hair in the bathroom when I heard noises coming from the apartment door. Someone was trying to get inside, knocking and pulling on the door handle. My stepdad and my siblings were at home with me, but my mom was out for some reason. I now do not remember. Thinking it may be her though, I opened the door. The moment I did, I saw an old wrinkled lady with foggy eyes and gray hair try to push past me into the apartment. At that moment, I thought I saw a ghost. 
I stopped her by blocking the way with my body and asked how I could help her. She was visibly shaken, and her adult diaper was pulled down around her ankles. She began crying and yelling that her son is trying to kill her because she didn't want to give him money for alcohol. She said he grabbed her by the neck and attempted to strangle her. I looked over her shoulder, but I did not see anyone chasing her. As this was a bizarre situation, I really didn't know what to do. So I called out to my stepdad. He walked the old lady back home and told me later she's bipolar or something akin, and that she was probably just confused. I'm not sure what to do about it, as her son was indeed an alcoholic and the situation did not seem too implausible. My mum later told me the lady would sometimes come to our apartment, thinking it was her place as she lived in the neighbouring apartment block also on the fourth floor, but I never saw her again. Fast forward two years or so, I'm taking a shower, and suddenly I get this very weird sensation. I remember randomly the foggy eyed old lady, and I knew that she had passed. As I got out the shower, the strange feeling lingered, and then all the toiletries and cosmetics began falling off the shelves. What was really weird is that some just fell straight down to the ground, and some flew in different directions. If someone asked me before this incident, what I would do if I saw things moving on their own, I probably would have said I would have noped out of there in a second and never come back. But I was not scared. I started calmly picking up everything and putting it back in place. And as I exited the bathroom, my mum entered the apartment with bags full of groceries. Mum, I said, following her into the kitchen. You'll probably think there's something wrong with me, but do you remember the old lady with glaucoma who came over here once yelling that her son was trying to kill her? Yeah, I do. She responded while unpacking the bags. I think she just died, I said. My mum then turned towards me. I don't think there's anything wrong with you. She paused for a moment, then continued. There was a fire in the neighbourhood as I was coming back from the supermarket. The firefighters were taking out the lady's body from the apartment. She probably fell asleep smoking or something and started the fire. Her son wasn't home. I looked at her with my mouth open without saying a word. Her eyes turned from my face to something behind me and back to me. And then she calmly added, don't be scared. She's here. When I was 13, a guy on the streets asked me if I had some money. This day I was in a good mood. And even if I was going to be late to school, I gave him a euro. This could have ended here, but he followed me onto the subway. At first, I didn't even notice him, but he sat just next to me. You must know now I'm a boy, but have a feminine shape. He started asking what my name was, how I was so cute, and if I really am a young boy. He told me that he would love to be my dad, and that he wanted me to be his submit. Fortunately for me, I arrived at my station and jumped off the train. But after school ended, he was still there waiting, looking at me. I decided that instead of taking the train, I would walk with my friends. I thought that he gave up, but as soon as I left them, he appeared again. So instead of leading him to my house, I slept at my friends and never saw him again after that. I gained a few followers on Instagram who asked if I could be their friend and send pics of me, but I blocked them immediately. So creepy guy who followed me on a train? Let's not meet. I was with the US Army stationed at Camp Casey, in the Dongducheon area of South Korea, north of Seoul, about 10 years ago. We had heard from one of the local taxi drivers about a hotel that was closed down. We asked other locals, and stories varied from a fire causing people to abandon it, to a shooting in the underground nightclub inside the hotel. Highly unlikely given the strict gun control there. The facts were sparse. All we knew was that a majority of the building is as it was left, the night people left. We gathered up a few friends that weekend and headed out of the gate, stopping for some coffee and street vendor food before heading to the old hotel. Once we arrived, we immediately noticed some structural damage, 
and immediately to the right on the reception desk, there was a wedding book and photos of the couple and attendees scattered across the surface. Very odd objects to leave behind and never come back for. We continued through the first floor sweeping each room military style, to ensure we were alone and not falling victim to pranks from the homeless, who we had heard often frequent the building. Continuing this trend as we ascended through the place, clothes were still in rooms, food was rotting on tables, but overall everything seemed normal. We reached the third floor from the top. Given the length of time since I've forgotten the exact number of floors, but we had confirmed on multiple occasions that nothing was able to be turned on, and that the electricity seemed to be cut. This is important because we were greeted by what sounded like a dryer rocking back and forth, like someone had left a heavy object inside it while it was still running. We progressed through the laundry room on the floor, only to have the sound stop abruptly about three meters out. We quickly brushed it off and figured there must have been a temporary surge of power because nothing in the room would turn on, or given any indication that it was operational. We also cleared the floor, like we had every other one, and ascended using both staircases to ensure no one could come down without being seen. Everything seemed to be going normally, reinforcing our idea that it must have been nothing on the floor below. But we still had one floor to go. Upon arriving on the top floor, we made our way to the largest room at the end of the hallway. Everything seemed to be in a better condition up here. No stains on the clothing or torn up wallpaper and carpet. I was called over by one of the other guys and pointed towards the window, where an upside down handprint was fully visible on the outside of the glass. At an angle, you couldn't reach from the inside, and too low to be touched from the roof. Even when using something to reach a rag outside and attempting to remove the handprint, it wouldn't go. This is where we began to be a little weirded out. Then we heard what sounded like a dryer banging up and down the hallway and set out to investigate. Again, the noise ceased upon approaching the door it was coming from. This time a janitor's closet, not a laundry room. We all saw movement in the peripheral vision down the hallway and a piece of pottery, which we hadn't seen before, struck the youngest of the group in the cheek and caused a small cut. Nothing serious, but concerning given we had scoured the building for other people. After that incident, and continuing to see movement from just outside of you, whether it was real or imaginary, we decided it would be best to leave. I don't know if anyone else has an experience of this nature, but at the time I was pretty rattled over it all. The feelings of dread on that top floor were unlike anything I've ever felt before in combat. If anyone else has also been to an abandoned hotel in the Dongducheon slash Tokiri area in Korea, it's probably the same one. This happened a while back. I was probably around 10 to 11, meaning my brother, Alex, was around 8 or 9. We were walking home from the bus, which takes seven minutes to do, when I noticed something was off. I didn't see anything at first, but I just knew something was wrong. So my brother and I started walking home. As the only two who got off at our stop, him and I, this blue and silver beat up truck drives past us, and I think nothing of it. It never slowed down or stopped, it just kept on going. Alex and I were holding hands as my grandmother always told me to do with him as he's my younger brother, and I don't want anything to happen to him. Nothing happens at first, but then the same truck drives around again, driving our way this time. There was a cul-de-sac at the end of our road, and it was driving slower this time as we went up the road and turned out of sight. Now Alex and I were nearing the three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac road to the other side road, right up the main road, the man just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving real slow down the street towards us again. I knew we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I would not be safe. I don't know how I knew, but I did. As soon as we passed a house that blocked us from view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him exactly four words. No questions. Just run. And we did. 
In our driveway, which is about 100 feet long, there's a row of bushes and pine trees that divides our home from the next door neighbor. I dragged him in there and told him to be quiet and that I would explain later. I watched as the same truck drove down around the cul-de-sac again, before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth shut because he was crying, and I was scared whoever was following us would hear him and hurt us. I was more worried for his safety at this point than my own. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister. I had to protect him. I looked at him and said the truck was following us, and I told him to not be scared. I said I wouldn't let anyone hurt him, and it seemed to calm him down a little bit. After what felt like hours, but was probably only minutes, the door to the truck opened and out came a man. He was tall, skinny and a mess, short hair covered by a torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts and a puke green tank top. He entered our yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes, and I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without getting this dude's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his car. He started to drive away slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure he was gone before turning to my brother and saying, we need to run. When I count to three, we're gonna run behind the house to the back door, okay? He agreed and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I still didn't have a good feeling about this, but I knew we had to move. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across our driveway and into our front yard to go around the house. As soon as we left our spot, I heard it, the sound of accelerating. He saw us, he waited for us to leave. He chased us up to our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house and made him run ahead of the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house key. The guy at this point was about 20 feet away from me. The garage door was open, and I swear to God this man ran around the opposite corner of the house that we did as we entered the house. I entered and slammed the door shut, locking it and deadbolting it. I didn't stop running until I opened the house door and ran downstairs with Alex screaming our safe word. Our grandma made a safe word for us that was a normal word that we could use if we were in danger. We just had to scream it. It woke my aunt up who worked the night shift and was asleep. We told her everything, and she stayed up with us until my grandma got home. We called the police, and that was my first time ever interacting with an officer. The man was never caught. To this day, I don't know what he wanted, but I know it wasn't good. I'm just glad my grandma drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother and I would be right now if she hadn't. So to the messy man in the blue and silver truck, let's not meet again. My mum has this big stand thing where we put hand creams and face masks, and it's about an inch away from the counter closet to the toilet. Sometimes when I use the toilet, it falls over on top of me. I have one of those lamps with about five heads and the shades are all different colors in my room for extra light. Sometimes when I'm sleeping, I wake up to a loud bang. I open my eyes and my lamp is lying on the floor. My little brother of one has a toy piano, where as long as you just touch the keys, it plays. Often I wake up to that piano playing. My siblings are at daycare, and my mum is at work all the time. I wake up, and I'm alone. I always turn it off. None of my siblings play with it, and it only happens when I'm alone. I have a white heat lamp for my geckos, but we haven't used one in a few weeks. Every time we screw in a brand new light bulb and turn on the lamp, the bulb will shatter. We've checked a thousand times that we're using the right bulb wattage for the right heat lamp. We even bought a new lamp and the bulbs will still explode. If anyone has any explanation for this, please tell me. I'm also scared to use the bathroom and scared to fall asleep. In 2018, the Saturday before Christmas, I was out on a birthday bar crawl 
In the Lower East Side, we were all getting a bit bored with the crowd and decided to go back to one of our friend's apartments to take a breather, listen to music, and decide what to move on to next. Cut to me realizing I had 10 missed calls from various members of my family. My uncle had been rushed to the hospital and didn't make it. My uncle was the youngest of my mother's siblings and was more like an older teenage brother to me than an uncle. We grew up together in a very close family. I didn't think I realized how quickly grief hits when you get news like that. The sound of my father's voice cracking and straining to get the words, he didn't make it, out of his mouth was more than I could handle. I crumbled into a pile of tears right in the middle of the kitchen. In a daze, I made my way back up to Harlem, trying to pull myself together and figure out what to do. I couldn't get anyone in the city on the phone. I couldn't get myself to call anyone in my family. So I needed to suck it up and get home that night. Mission accomplished. Flights changed. Bags packed with the help of my neighbor and a couple clonopin to get me the hell home. All of this to get to the point of the story. I'm barely able to keep myself together as I wait on the subway platform. The change of ticket and lack of savings wouldn't allow for a taxi ride to the airport. Just as I feel like I'm about to completely break down again, I notice a man in a lightly colored, absolutely beautiful suit. He had blonde bobbing curls on top and shortly buzzed on the sides. I turned to take a bit more notice. Then I saw his face. Strange to say, but I couldn't recall anything about it now. It's a blank space in very detailed memory. The only thing I can remember about his appearance was that he absolutely took my breath away. It wasn't an oh my god, this man is so sexy kind of way. It was the sheer admiration for the absolutely perfect and symmetrical face. So here we are, the only two people waiting at the stop on 145th. The man seems to be almost giddy with joy, as if he was seeing the world for the very first time. Not a crazed forced happiness. He seemed as genuine as a child in Disney World seeing the Magic Kingdom for the first time. When we boarded the subway, he sat mirrored to me. I was in the far left seat and he on the opposite side of the train on the right. It was quite crowded, but I looked up at some point before our 125th stop to see that he was staring directly at me. It wasn't scary. It was as if he was waiting for me to finally notice him. All he did was look me in the eyes, nod his head in confirmation and wink at me. It gives me chills to remember it. The comfort that washed over me felt like a warm embrace. I felt the security of a child who has scraped their knee, that feeling of mum making it all better. I was able to get myself home, head held high and without the help of the clonopin. I'm not a religious person. I've scuffed about God and I've felt resentful when anyone brings up their beliefs. I don't know how to explain it, but I have this deep feeling that I saw an angel that day. All alone and navigating through intense emotion, I truly feel this man was sent to give me the comfort and strength to get me home. It almost feels embarrassing to say it out loud, but I have no other explanation. This story happened two years ago. I was 16 on a trip to Armenia with my family. We had rented a car and driven around the whole country in about two weeks. This incident happened about halfway through the trip and scared the living daylights out of me. So my family and I were staying in this really fancy hotel for the night. My parents had decided to book it as a little treat because they usually just go for regular and simple hotels. We were all excited to stay there. It was big and luxurious with an indoor pool and gym. We all collectively decided to go for a dip in the indoor pool. It was really fun. We swam around, played with some volleyballs and just enjoyed the fact that we were the only ones in the pool. After having had our fill of splashing around, 
One by one, my family members decided to head back to our rooms to take a shower, until there was only my mother and I left. That's when the creepy guy arrived. We were still in the pool, sitting in the water, when a hotel staff member enters the pool room. I knew he was staff, because he looked like a local, and went to turn on the pool lights by the switch box on the other side of the pool. The first thing that struck me as odd, was that he purposefully walked by us staring directly at me with a creepy smile. I was a bit weirded out, but many people look at us weirdly because we look like Europeans. So light hair and skin, which is unusual for them. Anyway, he stayed in the room, doing something in the corner while my mum decided that it was time for her to leave the pool and head back. Because I shared my room with my sister, and I knew she was probably still in the shower, I remained in the pool. After my mother left, however, the guy kept giving me looks and staring at me. So I quickly changed my mind. I got out of the water, took my towel and started walking out. That is when the man decided to come and talk to me. He told me how pretty I was, and he thinks I'm beautiful. Asks for my age in broken English. And I just smile, nod, thank him and leave. Again? A tad creepy, but not unusual yet. I go into the ladies' bathroom, just next to the room with the pool, and it's just one bathroom, which is perfect, since all I wanted to do was quickly change up my swimsuit into some dry clothes, so that I didn't leave a trail of water in the nice hotel. About halfway through changing, suddenly a thought struck me. I hadn't locked the door. I'm half naked, so I turn around and switch the lock. I kid you not. Ten seconds pass and the doorknob wiggles. I innocently enough guessed it was another guest just wanting to change for a swim, or perhaps the cleaning lady. I'm done maybe a minute after, and step out of the bathroom and I see no one. Well, no one except the creepy guy walking away from the bathrooms. At that moment it hit me that he was the one who was trying to open the door. He turns around gives me a sickening smile, and walks back towards me. I booked it back to the pool, grabbed my shoes that I had forgotten, and he's right behind me. A bit too close for comfort. And he keeps giving me those creepy compliments. I give him a fake smile, and tell him I have to go. He then follows me out of the pool area, proceeding to walk just behind me, and I arrive at the exit of the wing without the pool, gym, bathroom and I see the door is closed. My heart stops. I'm terrified that he may have locked it. I've never been so relieved as to when I open the door with no issue. I almost ran out of there, him still standing by the door. I climb the stairs to my room, trying to calm myself down. I arrive to my floor, and that's when the elevator doors ding. Guess who steps out? That's right, the creepy guy. He leaves the elevator, walks to me, still smiling and pointing towards a flight of stairs leading to the rooftop. He asks me if I want to join him on the roof and look at the view together. I shakily decline his offer and run to my room, get in and lock the door, with the hope that he doesn't come knocking. He didn't. I saw him around the hotel a few times after that. He always tried to talk to me. I told my parents and they freaked out. But we didn't say anything since it appeared that he was someone quite important in the hotel. Maybe a manager or something. But nonetheless, why would someone be pursuing me, trying to unlock the room I'm changing in, and flirt with me when obviously he's getting nothing back, not to mention my age? I found it all quite disturbing and wrong. When I was around eight or so, we moved to a new neighborhood. Same state and general area, but completely new people. At the age of eight, I was nearly completely defenseless, and this will matter later in the story, because I had lost my leg to a car accident three years prior, and I was still learning to use a prosthetic leg. My house was the furthest one from the street, with only one way to the house, down the street. There were many houses that were very close to the street, 
and people could basically talk to you through their walls, they were so close. I'd never minded this, until I caught someone looking at me as I walked down the road. I thought nothing of it, must have just been someone watching the road and animals, but I was wrong. I walked alone down the road every time. My parents could trust me to go by myself, and I just decided not to ask them to pick me up because of my leg. It was one day, one single day that scared the ever loving crap out of me. The dude was on the left side of the street, and I was on the right next to him. He just looked at me, and I guess he found me cute, because of the look on his face and how he said, and I wish he never had, hi sweetie. I don't know him, he doesn't know me, but this weirded me out. I had a weird hairstyle and colour, a lot of hair not going down too much and mainly in front of my face, ending at my eye with a whitish colour. It was rare and people had called me cute when I was younger but hearing sweetie wasn't a rare occurrence, but the way he said it. It freaked me out, because behind his voice, I could hear a very sinister intention. I almost began running when he said that, but I kept on walking as if it were nothing. He didn't move, just watched me as I went back home. His house was close to the intersection where my bus parked off, which makes this a lot worse. Every day for around a month, I would walk down the street and see him watching me, every day for longer and more obviously. It was one day that he was in the middle of the road looking at me. I wasn't very tall nor muscular at all, so I was defenseless against a 40-ish year old man. He just looked at me, and as I walked by him he turned around and started to follow me. I ran, but he caught up, and the next thing I know he tugged on my backpack and I fell over. He kept me down on the ground and looked at me to make sure there was no one nearby, and then dragged me near his house. And then luck had just hit like a train. As he was trying to drag me, a man was leaving his house parallel to his. He saw and immediately began to sprint towards me. And the guy just ran back to his house fast and left me. He started screaming to the man, picked me up, set me down on my feet, and said to go home before he tried something else. I ran back to my house and told my father, who as you can imagine, was absolutely livid. I don't know what happened after that, but all I know is that I never saw the man again. I live in Japan, but I am American, so my language skills on both sides aren't too sharp. My spouse is Japanese, and we have one child together, and decided to move to Japan. So once I moved to be with them, we waited a few years before we started going house hunting. I didn't want to live in the country, since that's where I lived my entire life and hated it, and also didn't want to live in a big city like Tokyo or Kyoto. We compromised and decided maybe returning to my husband's hometown would be best so that way my in-laws could be involved with our son. I think everyone was pretty excited with my willingness to be closer to the family. We ended up finding a really amazing realtor, who was very patient with my American demands. Wide open floor plan, with 3-4 to four LDK, so bedroom, living room, dining room and kitchen. We went to see a couple of places, and in my mind, I'm pre-denying anything where my 5 foot 1 self could jump up and touch the ceiling, or if I could touch both walls with my arms outstretched in a hallway. I know the realtor was exhausted with my demands, but he worked hard and found a brand new development with almost everything I wanted. There were three homes he wanted to show us, so we brought our son and my mother-in-law, who helped keep his attention while my husband and I spoke to the realtor. The first home was nice ceilings, enough room for our family, but not enough parking. We moved on to the next house just next door. This place wasn't up to my expectations, it was much smaller than the first with an awkward layout. While I looked around with my mother-in-law, we heard what sounded like hammering upstairs. She mentioned that since it was a new development, 
the contractors may be finishing up and cleaning upstairs. That's when I noticed my son had wandered off. I called out to him and he runs down the stairs screaming for his grandma and pulling her arm with urgency. Before I could tell him to behave, the realtor hears the same hammering sound. My husband asks if the contractors were still here because we wanted to take a look upstairs. He replied telling us no, everything we were looking at today was basically ready to move in. And that's when my son started saying crow, crow. Confused, we followed the realtor upstairs and found in the main bedroom, several crows had been ramming themselves into the windows. They would perch up on the railing of the balcony, fly a short distance, then ram into the window with such force, they would fall on the balcony and lay motionless for a moment, before attempting to do it again and calling loudly. Our realtor uneasily ended this home tour abruptly. As we walked down next door, my mother-in-law mentioned how strange it was that the home we saw before only a few feet away didn't have the problem. I dismissed it that maybe the animals aren't used to the buildings, and Japanese crows are pretty annoying and have real personalities. Someone must have crossed them, right? I didn't like the home anyway. The third home felt so heavy as soon as we entered, I tried to ignore it and enjoyed the dining room just adjacent from the kitchen. It was almost perfect. I could make it work, I knew it. There was even a large backyard for our two dogs that the realtor even considered in his search. The living room was a bit small, but again, I could make it work. No crows upstairs, confirmed by my mother and son-in-law. I took it upon myself to look out the window of the living room. I really wish I didn't. See, my parents and sister always say we inherited a gift to see things others cannot. Throughout my life, I've been through so much therapy and taken so much medication to make the sounds and vision stop. But there's no such thing. I was in a very good place at that moment in time. And I look out the window and there's a small forest, tall trees and grass. But what was out of place was a large man standing there staring back at me in my direction. He didn't look right. He was charred. His skin was clearly burned. And although he was a good distance, I could see the shrinking crinkle around his neck and shoulders. I couldn't move. I wanted to so badly. That's when I saw his eyes directly. Dark black centers surrounded by white, as if his eyelids were burnt off. I heard my husband calling me, asking me something about my opinion until I guessed he noticed I didn't move or stop staring. I felt him step to my side and he asked if everything was alright. All I could muster, as I kept an eye with the man was, can you see him? I didn't want to stop looking in case he moved, and everyone thought I was crazy. My husband looked but said, the forest is nice. We need to make sure the dogs don't wander off in there and get ticks. He didn't see him, only I could. I thought I was good. I thought I got better. My husband asked me, do you see anything else or something? When he grabbed my hand to get my attention, I finally looked away to our realtor. Confused, he looked at me with an awkward smile. I guess I looked too serious and asked him what happened in the area. He said he didn't know when asked me why. I told him I saw a man in the forest and I didn't include the details. I just wanted to know if anything had happened. I watched him go through his folders and shake his head before telling me he didn't know, but since we were starting to like the home, he would check for us. It was an uneasy ride home. The burnt face of the man stuck in my head as my husband and his mother spoke about the last home's great features. A few hours later, we went to my in-laws place for dinner. My husband asking me why I was so quiet if I liked the home so much. Sending my son to another room to play, I explained to him and his parents in detail what I saw. Maybe they all thought I was crazy because his dad was quiet before getting up and going to another room and bringing a map. Pointing to it, he asked us if this was the area. My husband confirmed and my father-in-law's face was stoic and he nodded before explaining that there was a reason that area was a new development. The government just released the land because it had passed the allotted time of closure after an accident. He elaborated that when he was younger, 
he heard of a plane crash happened there, where several people died. The main area where it landed was still closed off and the government owned the place, where bodies and debris were found and cleaned up, and it has slowly been released. My mother-in-law is really superstitious, probably where my husband gets it from, and says we should forget that area. A few moments after dinner, we get a phone call from our realtor, who apologizing profusely that he didn't know any deaths had occurred in the area, confirmed what my father-in-law said was true. After his many apologies, he promised to do a better job researching his area, and asked if we had known about the area before. My husband replied saying that I am not familiar with anything in the entire city since I'm not from here. So there's no way that I would have known what happened many years ago. Once all the apologizing and promises were done, my husband hung up and his parents didn't judge me. They only said it's good to know sooner rather than later. They truly believe I have a talent as well, but even if that's true, I don't want to believe it, even if this isn't the only time this has happened. This happened a little while ago. I had a long day and I hate commuting. I see a free spot to sit in, so I take it. I was listening to music with headphones on and the guy who was sitting next to me says something. He was giant and didn't smell or look dirty, but he looked very messy, like he could be living in the streets or something. I removed my headphones to ask him what he said and he answered saying he wanted to know what the time was. I told him the time and tried to put my headphones on again, but he started to keep talking with me. I wish I'd just ignored him and put on the damn headphones. He asked me if I could help him get up when we got to the final station, since he has a disability. I thought nothing of it at the time and said, okay, sure, and tried to put my headphones back in again but was interrupted once more for him to say thank you, that I was very kind, and that not many people would help someone like me. I just said it was fine, when he kept insisting. You know, people don't really like to even see me when I walk the streets. It's hard. I felt pity for him, and thought, it's just small talk, it's okay. Maybe he has some issues and just needs to talk to somebody. I'm always really paranoid when commuting, because where I live, stuff happens to girls all the time. So I have a thousand eyes, and I'm looking back and kind of shocked that I didn't feel uncomfortable to this point, and tried to stop the conversation. Instead I said, yeah, I know people forget that people who have disabilities are a person like any other, and that they have lives. He stared at me for a second said, can I hug you? My inner paranoia started to freak out. I kind of half hugged him, like gave him a pat on the back with one hand, but he insisted and said both arms. I was kind of shaken, but tried to calm down thinking that maybe it was just some mental issue. I'm feeling bad for him and saying to myself, the guy was going through stuff. But then he did also reach up his hand up to mine. And he also wanted a high five. So I did that. He grabbed my hand and tried to lock his fingers between mine and I was like, nope, and quickly took my hand out. I was planning on everything to stop there, but he kept on talking. After this, I wasn't invested in the conversation anymore, but he started talking more about his disability. He said he fell down the stairs when he was five, so he lost mobility on his right side. I didn't really know this is possible, but then he reached his hand up to mine and said, see? I can't really move it. You heard that right. He reached his hand up to mine, moving it. And looking back at it, he hugged me with both his arms too. At this point, I was getting suspicious and paranoid. As time went by, he kept asking for personal info. Like, where did I go to study? What my name was? Where did I live? I was clearly uncomfortable, and you could tell I was making things up. At one point, he mentioned he studied journalism at a private university. But then he also studied acting at the same university I went to. So he asked, do you go there? 
I was kind of shocked and scared to be honest, but we arrived at the final stop and people were all around us so I almost felt obliged to help him get up. As I'm helping him I notice he barely leans on me and can stand perfectly well. I try to get off the train as quick as possible but he grabs me by the arm. I take my arm off and say, oh sorry I just gotta go. He was about to ask me where, but I was already gone. I don't know if he had a disability or not, didn't seem like it. And who knows what his intentions were if he was trying to stick me around. I'm glad I got out of there fast. This happened on the first time I went to Disneyland for four days with friends on a performing arts trip. It was day two. We were in our rooms without any adults. So there are three 11 year old girls alone in a sketchy motel. What could possibly go wrong? We were having a good time being loud as stupid kids usually do, playing truth or dare. And I vividly remember one of the dares was to post an embarrassing picture on Wishbone. And I did so and we were laughing like a bunch of hyenas. 11 PM rolls around and we hear knocks on the door and immediately get worried since it was lights out at 10. Whoever was there tugged on the door, but earlier that day, I argued with my friends that to make sure the door was locked. Being the balls of bravery, I take the initiative and go to the door, dragging a chair along behind me. I step onto the creaky chair and through the peephole, I see some guy with a stained black hoodie and no pants nor shoes. I turned to my friend and said, there's some guy at the door in just a hoodie. My friends were terrified while I was just kind of fed up with this, I thought about yelling, get lost, but my buddy decided against it, since he would realize that we were in the room. Not to mention I have a high pitched voice that makes me sound like a five year old, so he would know I was young. We were all pretty scared, and having previously been warned by our friends in other rooms to watch out for them, we stayed quiet. Five minutes later though, the man screams and runs off. My friends and I were horrified, as were I, but relieved. When the man turned to leave, I saw something in his hand. I could only see that it was shiny, long, and probably sharp, but decided to not mention this to my friends, to not scare them more. But what definitely creeped me out especially was that I don't know what would have happened if I didn't push my friends to check to see if the door was locked. Thankfully, we were safe that time behind the thinly veiled portal of a wooden door. This happened a few months ago in the summer when I had just moved to a new house. There's a community pool just down the road and the day after we moved in, I went there with some friends. But after an hour or so, I decided to go home because it was too hot. As I walked out of the pool's parking lot, a car also pulled out of it and stopped right next to me. The driver shouted something out to me, but I couldn't hear what he said. So being stupid, I went closer to see what it was he wanted. Are you the new girl who just moved in at house number five? I was confused, but again being stupid, I said, yeah. He told me that he just dropped his girlfriend's kids off at the pool and was just on his way home when he saw me and offered to give me a lift home. He might have been my neighbor, but he was a stranger in a car. I've never met him before and there's no way I was getting in, even if there was aircon. Thanks, but I'm okay, I said, and kept on walking. He then said something that I still think is bizarre, and I don't know why if it was a tactic of some sort, but he asked me if I at least wanted some candy. I was tired and hot, and it was the most stranger danger cliche I'd ever heard in my life. I'm 17. I don't want your candy. As soon as I said this, he apologized and told me, Oh, I thought you were the younger one. And finally drove away. Now immediately this put me on edge. Because I took that comment to mean that he was probably talking to me. Because he thought I was younger, which made my skin crawl. I also don't even know who he was talking about because I have a twin and a younger sister and he thought I, 17, looked way younger. I told my stepdad about what happened and he just played it off as me being paranoid. But I made sure that I told both my sisters 
as they also thought it was creepy as hell. I've always been a bit odd. I remember seeing colour shadows of people since I was five. I've had premonition dreams that come to pass. When I was in my late twenties, I was aligned with those that shared similar experiences. I delved deeper into my native Alaskan beliefs yearning for more understanding. So a few years ago, an acquaintance slash coworker asked for help at her apartment, a smudging as she felt a presence. I agreed as I'd conducted a few in the past. I arrived at an hour to midnight and was met by my coworker and another coworker. The rest of the occupants were not at the residency. The apartment was quaint, the entryway, living area, kitchen, small bath and two bedrooms. I began doing my thing, burning sage and chanting. I made my way through the rooms and as I did, I kept hearing the name Lucy. I dismissed it temporarily. Once I finished blessing the apartment, my coworker and I sat in the living room area. I had this nagging feeling to ask who Lucy is. Mind you, this living area was a TV stand, two sofas and a large square foot rest and a small door to a closet in one corner. So I ask, does the name Lucy mean anything to you? Can you tell me who Lucy was? The coworker that lived in the apartment went behind the smaller sofa and I hadn't noticed there was a walking space behind it. It was at an angle in the front of a window and she reached down behind the sofa and returned to the square foot rest in front of me and placed a pink gecko on the footstool, explaining, this is Lucy. I was shocked as I hadn't experienced an animal telling me its name before. I'd never met a lizard up until that point. The three of us were a bit awestruck as I had no knowledge of her pet lizard. Lucy was quite happy to scurry all over me, climb up my neck and remained nestled in my hair until I left. It was a beautiful moment that has me wonder if other people have had similar things happen to them. I have a story to share with you about when I was a night auditor at a hotel in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. This was a snowy winter night. Ski season was just starting, so we weren't super busy yet. We had a few guests, but was pretty quiet for the most part. My job was to do the audit, which took about an hour, then make my rounds to check all the doors that were supposed to be locked. The doors in the ballroom were the creepiest. I had to walk across a huge dark room lined with mirrors to turn the light on so that I could check the doors, then shut the lights off to make my way around the room again. I tried to get this done as quickly as I could, but I always felt scared. After that, I would make my way to the pool to check those doors and would make sure no one was still there. I had to do my rounds twice a night. In between those times, I basically sat at my desk and tried to stay awake. I'd play solitaire on the computer or read. Pretty boring, but I made the most of it. The front desk was enclosed with a small office behind it. So the only way to get onto the other side of the desk was through the office. The small office behind the desk had a door that I could lock and a small window that I could see and hear through if someone were to come up to said desk. In between my rounds was the longest part of the night, probably between 1 and 5 a.m. when I had to do my second round and started setting up the coffee table for the continental breakfast. I would sit in the back office at my desk in the dark and try to stay awake. Sometimes though it would be hard and I would rest my head on my arms and take a nap. I'm a very light sleeper, so I would always hear any noise and jump right up. Besides, at this time of the year and night, it was very rare to get a walk in looking for a room. Or this particular night, I dozed off at my desk and must have been asleep for half hour or so when I heard a loud whisper coming from the desk. It was as if someone was standing there knowing I was resting, but wanted to get my attention. Are you sleeping? The voice said. I raised my head and stood up to come out the desk, but there was no one there. Even as I came out the office and looked around the lobby and halls, I knew it was real. It was as if a guest or someone looking for a room had walked up to the desk, and the whisper was loud enough to wake me, bear in mind. I felt totally creeped out for the rest of my shift. Other employees would tell me the hotel was haunted, but I never knew whether to believe them or not. 
but after having that experience, I certainly do. In 2012, I was 11, and my family had gone to Brighton in England to see the rest of the pack. I live in Ireland, so it's a short and easy journey over that we did quite regularly, at least two to three times a year. Therefore, my sister and I were familiar with Brighton and its streets. One day, my sister and I met with our cousins, both girls, and my sister was the eldest of 14 at the time. Then my older cousin, who was 13, and I was 11, and my youngest cousin was 10. So we were all fairly young. We decided to go for a quick walk from my aunt's house to go over to the corner shop. It must have been about five minutes from the house, so not far at all. It was the middle of the day and my parents had no issue with us doing something as innocent as going to the corner shop. We make our way down and buy our goods. Can't beat a dib dab on a hot day. We left the shop and were hanging about outside, eager to eat our sweets before we got home, so we didn't get shouted at. That's when we were approached by a man. My memory of what he looked like is hazy, but I recall him being around 60 years old, white hair, slightly stooped over. I remember him hanging back away from us, watching from a nearby alley. My cousin and I were young. We just thought this was funny. Something embarrassing and laughable. We start walking away when we notice him out of the corner of our eyes. Again, we found this funny. I don't ever recall being educated on the risks of stranger danger in school. This was just something I would have laughed at. Slowly, he started catching up with us. We just thought this was a big game. I could smack 11 year old me for being this immature. The corner shop we were originally at was near a roundabout in a little, so we began crossing the road at the roundabout. We did this several times just to see if he would still follow, and he did. We got into the car park at Little and he approached us. Now he was within talking distance, like the distance between you and a friend. He was muttering incessantly under his breath, and I couldn't exactly make out what he was saying. I do recall hearing small words, such as swine and other things. And that's when our giggles got a bit quieter. Now Brighton is slightly rife with issues due to mental illness and addiction. It has a high homeless rate, and even at 11, I understood this. The auntie I had been staying with at the time is a psychiatric nurse, and she was inundated with clients and patients from Brighton. When he approached us and broke that intimate, invisible bubble that sets social expectations and normality, I got a chill. This small interaction in body language seems tiny and superficial, but anyone that's been in a bad situation knows what I mean by that weight that suddenly falls on your chest, full of foreboding and dread. It's hard to exactly define it, but it terrified me. I think my sister and my cousin got this feeling as soon as I did. It wasn't playtime anymore or mockery. This was bad. I don't know what it was, but I knew we had to leave and leave fast. We started to walk away from this man without uttering a word to each other. We all knew. We walked quite fast and began to follow the road to the house. Of course, he followed us. This time, however, he was faster. We were genuinely scared. This man was following us, four blatantly young girls, and if he continued, he'd know where we were staying. This was when a guardian angel in disguise swooped in to help us. It was very sudden. A woman and her three children came out of a cafe on the other side of the road and ran across the road to our side. We then formed a strange circle as we walked, her children, who were the same age as us it seemed, at the front, me, my sister and my cousins in the middle, and this woman in the back. She ushered us along quickly and quietly and kept saying, keep walking until I say to stop, don't look back. The man started losing sight of us when the woman walked us home. I think he lost interest once he saw the woman and her band of tiny soldiers. We got in the house, terrified and shaken up, and the woman told my mum and my auntie what happened. They were naturally petrified. It turns out the woman had been watching the interaction from the cafe the entire time. From the corner shop to the car park, she said that this man was notorious for being a predator, and that she recognised him 
as a well-known one in Brighton. I don't remember much after that apart from my family being scared. I don't know what would have happened if this woman had not helped us. Our immaturity and naivety could have seriously harmed us. If I could meet this unnamed heroine, I'd thank her profusely. Now at 19, I recognize this man as someone who probably had issues with mental illness or addiction, and I hope he's not causing himself or others harm. In any case, let's not meet again. I'm a registered nurse and a medical student, so I tend to gear towards a rational and scientific explanation to everything. Despite that, during my nursing career, I've had some truly mind-blowing experiences happen to me when patients have passed or when patients were in altered mental states. To be specific, I felt patients pass prior to their passing. I saw their souls leave, or in some cases linger after the passing. I've had patients describe other patients who've just passed as standing behind me, full physical detail having never met or seen said patient. One night I was working on the surgical floor, which used to be Pede's ward, and all of a sudden a very sober-minded patient says he sees a little girl banging on the window asking to let her out, because it's too cold on the other side. It still gives me shivers to this day. One day when I was around five or six years old, I saw a picture of a girl at my grandpa's house and asked him why is this girl not coming to play with me anymore? I assumed her to be a family friend's daughter. He turned pale as a ghost and said that I must be confused and explained to me that this was my late sister whom I never got to meet as she passed before I was born. When I was 17 to 18 years old, my family rented this beautiful apartment for about two to three years. I always saw things there and had this feeling of dread, anxiety and sadness. One night I went to bed and the lamp on my night table turned on by itself and fell next to me. Long story short, after we moved out, my parents told me that there had been one passing due to suicide, a hanging in my room, and one death due to overdose in the bathroom. I always told my parents there was something wrong with that place, but they just denied it until we finally moved. And I was able to predict tragedy in our family even though I didn't know whom it would happen to. I mean, a few months before my grandpa's passing, I said I'm worried about him, only that I was worried about the wrong grandpa, as I had two at the time. Same thing happened with my grandma a few years later. Like I knew something bad was about to happen, some random stuff I was about to predict, like a birth of my daughter a year before I got pregnant with her, my friends having babies before it even happened, and work-related stuff like transfers or cuts, but that's all minor. Now, two weeks ago, my significant other passed away in his sleep due to a heart attack at the age of 35. To say that I felt like my heart was ripped from my chest is to say nothing. One day we were planning our wedding, and the next day I was preparing his funeral. And this is what gets me. I got no signs or premonitions that this was coming. The only thing I can say is that I was experiencing my own heart having palpitations and episodes when I felt like it skipped a beat, had it been about a year. But I wonder if I'm just attributing this as something related. After his passing, I was going mental, praying, which I never do, and talking to myself, begging him to send me a sign, any sign that he's okay. But I had nothing, no dreams, or anything. Then one day, I'm having a breakdown while picking up my teenage sister from her school, and she breaks it to me that she woke up one night at 3am after having a dream about V. He appeared to her in his favourite basketball shorts, she didn't know those were his favourites, but I did, and there was nothing around him. But he smiled and said, I am okay, the exact words I used and he disappeared and then she awoke. I have to note that nothing ever affects my sister. She is in her own world and you can have a nuke drop next to her and she wouldn't flinch in her sleep. She said she felt very energetic after her dream and didn't go back to sleep. I had his Bretling watch 
and when I went to retrieve it, I noted that, because it wasn't moved in a while, that the time stopped at 3am sharp. Perhaps this was a coincidence, but if you add up the amount of minutes and seconds and hours that a watch has to click through, it's incredibly unlikely. Thereafter, many weird strange things happened, like YouTube kept coming up with suggestions of songs with ghosts in their name. Much more stuff happened, but I attributed it to going mental and seeking out the signs. A few days ago, me and my sister were in the kitchen. My daughter was just upstairs, but very close to us, with no one else in the house. Me and my sister were talking about my significant other, when all of a sudden we both hear my daughter call my name. I go to check on her and she's genuinely confused. She's eight, playing on her iPad, and she never called my name. I got so mad at her, thinking she was just joking with me, but her confusion and fear were genuine. My sister and I both heard it, and were very shaken by it. To clarify, the voice was unmistakably that of my daughter. Yesterday I was on our Reddit paranormal, and out of the blue, the text on the page started to shake. I don't know how else to describe it. Right after I came across the post of a medium who was replying to another Redditor, but it felt like that message was for me. I read the original post and my mind was blown. So many details down to the initial of her friend passing away. It was identical. I replied on the post, and that seemed to be too much of a coincidence. I want to believe that my significant other is trying to communicate with me, and I want to believe that he can see or hear me, but it frustrates me I'm not getting anything tangible from him. Anything like a dream or a vision, something that I couldn't just explain away. I'm confused as to why I can't pick up as much from him as I could with others. At the same time, I feel like he's just trying to relay a message to me. Perhaps I'm going mental with grief while holding onto any thread. But your insight in this situation is truly appreciated. I'm a fairly fit 22 year old female. I work for a pretty well known health club in Northwest England. I've been on a pretty simple path of self improvement while working part time and studying at university. Therefore, when my manager asked me if I wanted to do a lifeguard qualification for our poolside, I happily agreed to it. It was an all expense paid trip, so I would never have to say no. They paid for my travel, which was about an hour away from where I was living, but I drive, so they just paid my petrol. The hotel, the food, which was of course pretty cool. The way the course was set out was pretty normal for a lifeguard course, I assume. It was three days worth of training, four days off, and I returned back home to work. And then I would travel back again for three more days, and on the third, graduating from the course and be a lifeguard. The first three days were amazing. I found my hotel pretty easily, and although it was in a dodgy looking area, I did sleep well, and the staff were nothing but helpful. I was hoping to return to the same hotel for my final three days, However, the day before I was due to return, due to my last three days, my manager told me the hotel was fully booked. He quickly booked me another one which was in the middle of the town centre. I looked the hotel up and the exterior was dodgy, but I thought I may as well give it a chance, as it was only for two nights. I went to my first day at lifeguard training as normal. When one of the local girls told me the hotel I was about to stay at had no on-site parking. She also mentioned that all the surrounding car parks were only for short stays, max two hours, and it would be best to leave my car at the training center, and she would take me to my hotel and pick me up in the morning to go to training. I thought that was a very kind offer, and thanked her, and took her up on it. After finishing for the day, I got into her car, and she took me to my hotel. She also mentioned that she used to rent near this hotel, which was a small family-run business and not a chain. It had no room service, nor kitchen, and therefore pointed me in the direction of Sainsbury's, McDonald's, and Subway. Perfect. Night one in the hotel. I walked around in the hotel, the lobby seemed nice, although there was construction in the surrounding rooms. 
The girl at the front desk, a blonde with blue eyes, greeted me and began checking. She smiled and let me know I had been upgraded, but since she didn't know why, I didn't question it. I was just happy to be in the executive suite. She walked me to my room, which was like a maze. You need a special key card to get to my set of rooms, the executive suites. This meant no random people could walk through the hallway near my room, and I felt safe. Upon entering, I was amazed. I'd never been in something so classy. The room was massive. On the left, there were stairs to the bathroom. Stairs! There was a balcony, a queen size bed, a couch, a TV with Netflix, and a table full of complimentary water, tea, and biscuits. I chilled for a bit and then suddenly realized how hungry I was, and thought that I should nip to Sainsbury's before it gets dark. All was good. On the way back from the shop was when it all started to get weird. I returned to the hotel and got to the door which needed the special key to open the doors for the executive suites. And there was a man just outside dressed in a suit. We looked at each other for a moment before I walked past and scanned the door open. I automatically regretted it. The man followed me through very closely. Now I'm a very nervous person. I panic at practically anything. And it drives me crazy. Of course, I panicked at this point and thought better safe than sorry and literally ran to my room. However, I turned my head slightly to see the man had kept up with me. Very well. I started to weep, opened the door extremely clumsily, threw myself in and slammed the door closed. The weirdest bit was that the man actually looked as though he was about to walk into the room with me. Now you're probably thinking, why didn't I call front desk? Truth is, I don't know. Maybe I should have. But with how the story progresses, I know I had done the right thing by not calling the front desk. You'll understand shortly. I eventually calmed myself down and thought about running myself a bath before Love Island started at 9pm. I ran the bath, stripped, and sat on the toilet. I left the bathroom door open because it was a nice hotel room and I had no reason to close it. I had a very clear view of the front door. I stand up to flush and hear a noise like the sound of the front door opening. I look up. The door is open. I ran to the bathroom and slam it and lock it, and I sank to the floor and cried. I turned the bath off and I listened closely to the room outside the door, but heard nothing. I messaged my best friend, who lives in Crete, so even if something did happen, she would have been unable to do anything about it. I don't even know why, I just thought there was no way this was actually happening, and if I called the police, I'd be laughed at. I sat on the floor for a half hour until my friend convinced me it was all in my head and just to check. I let her know my hotel name and room number, just in case, and told her that if I didn't reply in five minutes, no matter what, to call the police for me. She agreed and I left the room. It all looked normal. I checked under the bed, the balcony, the wardrobe, and everything was fine. No masked intruder. Although, I tried to lock the front door with the manual lock that are normally on the hotel room doors, but found there wasn't one. This frightened me a bit. I laughed at myself, grabbed one of the two bottles of free water, and downed it during Love Island and fell asleep soundly. I awoke the next day and got ready quickly because I overslept, grabbed the last water bottle, and ran to meet the girl who was picking me up for training and forgot all about the night's events. Now, for the last night at the hotel. Here's where it gets weirder. I come back relatively early to revise for the assessment next day. It was 30 degrees outside, and in the unair conditioned room, I was hot. So I stripped to my underwear, and noticed that none of the complimentary waters had been restocked. So I assumed maybe it was just a one-off thing, considering I never really paid full price for the room anyway. I revised for about half hour before the heat made me sleepy. I don't even remember falling asleep, but I do remember the sound of the door next to me slam shut. The front door. I felt groggy and didn't open my eyes straight away. When I did, 
It took my eyes a few seconds to adjust. I brushed it off quickly until I sat up straight. My eyes focused on the table, which was now full of complimentary water. It definitely wasn't there before. It was next to my bed. So was a random sock, a black ankle sock. That was not mine. One of my socks though, that I had put in a pair was no longer on the floor, but had gone missing altogether. Like someone had taken my sock and replaced it with their own. My mind automatically thought that it had been the staff and therefore I didn't complain to management. This was not a chain hotel where a creepy employee couldn't be held accountable, but a family business. What if I had complained to the creep that had actually been doing this? I barricaded myself into the room and barely slept that night. Upon checkout, an elderly man was at the front desk, who I'd only ever seen in passing and he asked if I liked my room. I tried to be polite and said yes, despite the weird events, which I began to question myself about again. He told me my manager had rang the day before I arrived and he decided to give me a quiet room to myself, which he likes to do for the younger girls. He then asked me to leave them a good review. I began to feel uneasy again, but had my lifeguard assessment that day, so I pushed it to the back of my mind. I passed with flying colors and drove home. It wasn't until I sat down on my own bed that the situation hit me. Something wasn't sitting right. So I went to the hotel on TripAdvisor, something I should have done or my manager should have done from the very start before sending a young girl there alone. Three separate reviews. Out of the four reviews that I actually bothered to read, before feeling too physically sick at what I read to continue. Three contained a warning to women. Men were trying to get into their rooms and staff would walk in unannounced, even when they were confronted, the staff would deny it. This was when I knew I had not made what happened up in my head. People or a person had been coming into my room while I slept half naked and stayed for an unknown period of time taking my clothes. It still sends a chill down my spine just sharing this with you now. I let my managers know who made complaints against the company, but so far nothing has come of it. I don't know what else to do about this situation. It is absolutely disturbing. I was a 19 year old female when this took place. It wasn't overly late, about 8pm, but it was winter so it was already dark. I was walking home from visiting a friend, about 20 minutes from home. It was quiet and I had headphones in just listening to music, so I didn't hear this guy approach from behind me. All of a sudden, this cyclist has slammed on his brakes directly besides me and is staring at me. I take my headphones out to glance at him, but he doesn't speak, just stares. I keep walking and I'm pretty close to home now, so I wasn't too worried. This guy starts cycling again, slowly now, matching my walking speed. I keep my eyes forward and ignore him, fully aware he's still looking at me. I get to my flat. I walk down this really quiet, dark country lane, and although it wasn't very long, it wasn't an ideal place to be with this guy. So I stopped and glanced down at my phone, hoping he'd keep going. He did, for a short while, but then he turned around to watch me. There was no way I was walking down that lane with this guy there. So I crossed the street and went down another road. A well lit one with lots of houses, hoping it would be safer. That's when he said something that chilled me to my core. Where you going? You don't live that way. I know where you live. I wanted to be sick. He could have been bluffing, but the way he said it, I believed him. I was terrified. I dialed my parents number and kept walking aware of this guy following me even now. When my partner answered, I quietly asked him to come get me when I heard the guy go, oh shh, and he cycled off ahead of me. I don't know what startled him so much. I guess it was because he thought I was calling the police, but he took off and I'm forever grateful he did. My home is next to a friend's who I grew up with. His parents live across the road from him, a caddy corner to me. 
There's a field in between my friend's house and mine. I'm telling you all of this because location and home placement become relevant soon. So my neighbor's oldest daughter started messing with a Ouija board. I don't know if that is what started all this, as we had incidents in the past, but all of this particular phenomenon that I'm talking about here happened after. I tried to tell her that she didn't need to mess with it and that she didn't understand the extent of things she was attempting to contact, but she's 14 and did not listen. I know people play with them, but I personally believe that they can let things in that you don't want. A few weeks after this, my neighbor's stepson saw a light shining in his bedroom window. He went outside to investigate and found nothing. The light began to make appearance in all three of the houses I mentioned, my neighbors, his parents across the road and mine. My mum, I'm grown but have to live with her because of a seizure disorder that I have and can't control, says one night, I see a light. She said it looked like a flashlight through her window, but shining on the ceiling. I went out to investigate quite pissed off because I thought someone was messing with my mum. I couldn't find anyone, so I called the cops. Keep in mind at this point, it has been going on for a week to all three houses. The deputy shows up and takes me around with him, investigating then makes a very interesting point. There was dew on the grass even though it was night, and my footprints were the only ones visible. Interesting and strange, I thought. While well, my neighbor's mum started seeing this light every night in her bedroom, she sleeps on one end of the house and her husband on the other, because he has to get up early for work. So every time she looks out the window, there's nothing to be seen. She also starts to see what looks similar to laser pointers doing the same. It shines through the window onto the ceiling, and it apparently was not exactly like a laser pointer, but quite similar. Now here's where things start to get strange. My neighbor was in his garage and saw the laser pointer on the wall. This was at night, and he was out in his garage smoking a cigarette. He steps outside and sees nothing, walks back into his garage, and it's on the back of his wall. Then, he said that it spread out and morphed into a strange, ancient looking religious image, like something out of an ancient Eastern religion. He said it maybe looked Buddhist, he can't really describe it any better than that. So fast forward a few days, his mum had still been seeing the lights and the laser like image continually. So he messages me and asks to sit with him in the shadows outside of his house and watch his mum's house. Her bedroom is facing his yard. We sat up there for about an hour or so, and we were actively watching her house for anything whatsoever, lights, movement, the like. We see nothing, and she texts him saying that all the lights are shining in her window, when we saw nothing at all. So we take off to her backyard, and walk behind her shed where the lawnmower was are to get a better look. And on the way to the shed, he spins around and says, man, do you smell that? It's not like something was burning, like burning leaves mixed with sulfur. We looked around the shed towards the main part of the yard and lawn, and a street light at the house right next door to them. So we had a good view of her lawn from this angle. We sat there, and there was a haze and fog on her yard only. We thought that maybe someone had been burning something, but thought it was strange since it was only on her yard. We spoke about this for literally about 10 seconds behind this shed, and he says, Hey, the smell is gone. I realized that he was right, and we looked around the corner of the shed and the fog was completely gone. This would not have gone in 10 seconds. Well, about a week later, his mum is getting fed up with the nightly light show, and instead of looking out her bedroom window like usual and finding nothing, she starts looking out other windows. She gets to her living room and notices that at my house, keep in mind, I'm caddy corner across the road from her, that there's a fog behind my house. She said it was in the woods behind my house, and there are woods like 30 feet or so behind it, and extended just into the yard. She said it was dimly backlit as well, not brightly, but noticeably. Here's where things get strange. She says that at this point, five or 
six strange translucent figures come out the fog into my yard, right outside my bedroom and into the field between mine and my neighbor's house. She said they were very human shaped roughly, but strange looking and didn't give many details about their features because she couldn't see the features very well from where she was. They looked almost like a hologram. I'm not sure what she meant by that. She couldn't fully describe their appearance, just that they came out of the haze and into the field and then glided over the ground without stepping. She said they kept getting in a group and bending over and squatting down and doing something like that. She didn't know what they were doing, but it made her think of digging. So they glide across the field, across the road and through her yard, past her house towards the barn into the woods. She said that every time she saw them pass by her house, the lights would happen on her ceiling in her room. She said that made this strange journey back and forth a total of five times that night, one time after another. That's basically it. I don't know what to make of it. I hope maybe some of you can shed some light on this inexplicable phenomenon. In college, I went on a trip to Vienna through a program with my university. There were eight of us college students, including me, and then two professors. A little info about me. I had lived in different countries and traveled all my life due to my dad's job. Also, because of my dad's job, he taught me from a young age to be aware of my surroundings and how to spot people who might wish to do me harm. Since I am small with blonde hair and blue eyes, I tend to stand out in most other countries. Anyway, enough background. Here's the cast. Me, my oblivious friend, who's also my roommate, my two professors, and the old crazy man. We had an evening to kill and decided to go to the local film festival to see what was going on. There were a couple of interesting things that happened to us while at the film festival that were kind of odd, but more funny than anything. We were on the subway heading back to our hotel once that had concluded. The subway was pretty empty since it was late at night, but there were 10 of us in the back of the train and a few people at the front. We were having a good time when my flatmate and my second professor were being really loud and trying to be the center of attention. I looked towards the locals and saw that all the noise caught the attention of an old crazy man. He was really scruffy with long wiry hair and had a long unkept beard. His clothes were pretty soiled and his shirt was halfway unbuttoned, exposing his chest. We made awkward eye contact and I looked away and back towards the group. I had a gut feeling about this guy. There was something about the look in his eye that made me uncomfortable. About a minute later, I looked back and he had moved to sit in the middle of the train, closer to us, staring at our group. I knew something wasn't right. I looked at the group to see if anyone had noticed this guy, but of course they hadn't. I didn't want to say something to make a big deal out of possibly nothing. So I decided to portion myself where I could see over the old creepy man from the corner of my eye and still looked like I was conversing with the group. So I decided to position myself to where I could see the creepy old man from the corner of my eye and still looked like I was conversing with the group. Over the next few minutes, just before our stop, he inched his way closer to us. Ever so slowly, he would approach. I knew our stop was coming soon, so I figured he would either stay on the train or we'd lose him at the station. Our stop came and we got off and started heading up the stairs. I positioned myself in the back of the group so I could see what this guy would do. He got off the train and followed us up the stairs also. He had this crazed look in his eyes. This station was fairly busy, so I figured we'd lose him in the crowd. Nope. We were now outside the station, walking down the street to our hotel. I remember the street being extremely dark because there was construction going on on both sides and there were no street lights. We were the only ones on the street, as well as, of course, the crazy old guy. I finally grabbed Professor One by the arm and slowed him down to where he was joining me in the back of the group. I told him we were being followed, and he looked over his shoulder and saw the old guy 20 feet away. He told me not to worry about it, and that it was unlikely he was following us. We rounded a corner a few seconds later, only to have the creep follow us. 
I nudged him to tell him, and he shifted, and I could tell that he too was now uncomfortable. I just looked at him like, told you so. I softly pressed my hands on the back of my roommate, who, by the way, was still being really loud, and started to walk faster, making her and the others in front walk faster too. The professor followed my lead, calmly getting everyone to walk quicker. We started to gain some distance and made our way into our hotel. Everyone sat in the lobby, as the professors were going to give us the agenda for the next day. The professor stopped and asked if I was all right, and I told him that the guy was following us and had been watching us since the subway. The professor, of course, was appreciative that I had let him know. We joined the group and started going through the next day's agenda. The facade of the hotel was literally just windows, and from the corner of my eye, I saw movement outside. And of course, you'll guess who was there. None other than the creepy old man. The look in his eyes made me freeze, and I felt physically cold. I knew it was just him staring at me. Bang. We all heard it. Every person in the lobby jumped. The creepy old man was banging on the window with both fists without breaking eye contact with me. The professor stood up and got in between me and the creepy old man, blocking his view. He started to slowly turn and walk away, still keeping eye contact with me. This was the first time that the rest of the group noticed this old creepy dude. They all looked at me and the professor and asked what was happened. Not wanting to freak out any of the other students, he said, and see kids, this is why we don't do drugs. He got a chuckle from the group and they all went back talking as if nothing happened. 10 minutes later, the group went up to their rooms and it was just me, my flatmate and the professors in the lobby. I was filling in my flatmate and the second professor about the creepy old man. And we were now laughing because we thought that it was all over. But of course it wasn't. The sliding glass door opened and the creep walked in. I stood up. I didn't want to be in a sitting position if he approached me. Once again, we made eye contact, but he kept walking straight past the front desk and down the hall that led to where the rooms were. I could barely hear it, but he was muttering something in German. I know enough to get by, but certainly not that much to hold a lengthy conversation. Since I was far away as he spoke, I didn't really hear it. I turned to the other three men who were sitting there in shock as he was back. I went to the front desk and explained to the clerk what was going on and that the creepy old man had been following us all night. He called for security and suggested that the professors take us two girls to our room and then return to theirs. The professor called my flatmate back to our room on the second floor without running into the creepy old man. I thanked them and asked if they would message me when they made their way to their rooms. They then sent a group text to all of us to not leave our rooms for any reason tonight. My flatmate was shaken by the experience and I reassured her we would be fine so long as we stayed in our rooms. It was really hot in our room and I went to open the window. Since we were on the second floor, I figured that this wouldn't be a problem. The window faced the courtyard that was in the middle of the hotel and all the rooms circled around it. In the courtyard, the creepy old man was screaming, speaking German, and the words that I caught were girl, blue eyes, and mine. This sent chills through my whole body. Security called police and we watched them escort him out of the hotel. I had a hard time sleeping that night, knowing the whole time he was following me and he wanted me. I overslept this morning and didn't end up leaving my house until 11 a.m. Side note, my family's car has been broken down for a few months, so I was walking to school. It usually takes me half an hour to walk to my school, and I had my headphones in listening to music at full volume, so I couldn't hear anything around me. So I was jamming out to my songs and I see this black ute drive past me. I didn't think anything of it since people drive down the street all the time, but it did a U-turn at the end of the street and passed me again. 
I thought I was being paranoid when it kept driving past me, so I tried to look through the window to see who it was, but the windows were tinted. It must have driven past me at least seven times at this point, and I was freaking out, man. Since I live in Australia, we all have uniforms, and at my school there's a junior and senior uniform. As a senior, it's very obvious I have a stripe down the length of my shirt. I had no idea what was going on with this dude, but I was nearing the end of the street, and I was relieved when he turned off at the end of it. I turned the corner and was almost at the front gates when I saw him, parked between me and my school, as I walked as quickly as I could. And that's when I heard the door open. At this point, I sprinted into the school grounds and hid behind a bush. I hear the door slam and he peeled away from the school. I didn't tell anyone until about five minutes ago, when me and my mum were walking home from the shops. Apparently, there's been a guy in a black ute in the area, doing dodgy things. This is an experience I had on a sleepover, with three other girls of my sophomore year of high school. It was my friend Tina's birthday. I wasn't that close to her, but she was friends with my best friend Hannah, so we all knew each other. I had never been to her house before. I really didn't want to go to this girl's birthday party, but Hannah wanted me to go with her. Hannah also knew one of Tina's friends, Audrey, who was going to the party as well. A girl, Pam, was there, but none of us really knew her. So far, this had been a normal sleepover, despite Tina being a little off as usual. This wasn't weird though, since she's always an odd compulsive liar type girl. We were all watching Hercules. Her parents had gone to bed, and they had put out a fold couch in the living room, and down the hall there were two queen-sized beds in a guest room for all of us to share. Tina's room and her parents were on the opposite end of the house. Tina decided she didn't want to sleep with us anymore, so she went to her own room. Pam went to the guest room to text her boyfriend and go to bed. Audrey, Hannah and I laid on the fold couch together to talk. We had our backs to the hallway and we were facing the sliding glass door into the backyard. We kind of started to see things move outside and we started getting creeped out. We talked about going to the guest room, but we didn't want to bother Pam. We got the sickening feeling that we were being watched from the hallway. When we looked, nothing was in the hallway. But in the picture frames, we could see the shadow of a man walking back and forth down the hallway. I decided I should check on Pam. I got off the couch and ran down the hallway to see she was asleep. When I turned around to tell Hannah and Audrey, a chill ran through my body and I fell down. Hannah screamed and told me not to move. They both ran over to me, and we went into the guest room and slammed the door. Audrey and Hannah got on the daybed against the wall, and I got into bed with Pat, who woke up asking what was going on. I was having a full-on freakout inside, not knowing what to think of anything that had just happened. The beds we were on had been pushed together. The closet was open and full of empty hangers, and I could hear the hangers moving but I refused to look away from my feet, paralyzed in fear. All of a sudden, a giant glowing white mass grabbed Hannah's palm and I by our feet and tried to pull us off the bed. Pam and I jumped over to Hannah and Audrey's bed. Then the bed Pam and I were on flew to the other side of the room. I tried to rationalize it, saying it was a cat or something, but Tina didn't have any pets. So we all sat against the back of the daybed, scared. Pam had goosebumps all over her body. I couldn't even bring myself to speak. Audrey was trying to ignore it, and Hannah was trying to control the situation. Then the bed started bouncing. It felt like something was pushing us from under the bed. It was a violent bounce too. Then it stopped and Hannah started looking behind me. When she pushed me forward, then screamed. We all asked what happened, then she said she saw something reach for me, pushed me, then it scratched her. She lifted up the back of her shirt to show three long scratches down her entire back. 
The bed bouncing continued, lights flickered, and things in the closet began moving. At three, we decided to sit out in the living room, grab our courage and ran out the room onto the couch. We all saw the figure of a man still walking in the hallway and called up our families to pick us up as soon as possible. No one answered, so we left messages. So we creeped out the house and went into the backyard and sat on the trampoline waiting until someone woke us up or we got picked up. When we saw the security bar fall and the door lock, we got up and tried to open it, but not only was the bar down, but the lock had been locked on the door. So we waited. Her mum woke up and got us and didn't ask us why we were outside or how the door was locked or anything. We all left as soon as we could, but before Hannah and I tried to figure out why everything happened, but we couldn't debunk anything. I never went back to Tina's house, ever, after that night. I've been working as a hotel night auditor for almost six years now. And boy, do I have some stories to share with you. However, today's true terror tale takes place many years ago, when I was still fairly new to the position and location of my property. It was 11pm, and I was entering into the hotel lobby. I right away noticed two individuals sitting in my lobby, and could hear a loud one sided conversation taking place in our designated breakfast area. The vibes the hotel were putting off were unsettling to say the least. I go around the corner and enter the office where I see my co worker already packed and practically one foot out the door. Before she left, I made sure to ask, What's up with the people in our lobby? Didn't you inform them that we have a no loitering policy? Or did you so gracefully leave me to do that? Before she could even finish her sentence, she was gone. Little did I know that would be the last time I would ever see her again. One of the transients, a man was sitting in the chair facing my desk directly. He stared at me with such wrath, such unfiltered darkness. He was mumbling incoherently. A woman sat beside him, she was dressed in shorts and a t-shirt during winter, digging her long jagged nails into her thighs while moaning inappropriately. Then lastly, a woman overdressed for the winter comes up out of the breakfast room carrying a cracked cell phone. At this time, I see my chance, so I tell them, excuse me, it appears that we are sold out for the night and there's a no loitering policy in our property. Would you like me to call you a cab? Or do you have a ride coming? At that moment, the man stands up and pulls out a large hunting knife from his coat and approaches the desk. I was literally wetting myself when he leans into me and says, Ma'am, you smell toxic, like your blood isn't right. God has sent me to cleanse the world of all evil toxics. As he's saying this, his eyes begin to shift from black emptiness to crimson red massacre. I took off leaving the work phone but grabbing my cell phone into the back laundry room. I knew I wasn't safe there and that every second I spent trying to think of what to do was a second they would advance on me. I decided to make a dash for one of the empty rooms. I could secure myself in there. I just had to be faster than the three Christian crackheads. I didn't think beyond that. I threw open the door and booked it for the suite. I don't know how, but I must have had the speed of a thousand gazelles and made it into the room without any chase pursued by the toxic Avengers. While in the room, I dial 911 on my cell and begin pushing any furniture I could in front of the door. As I'm on the phone with the police, I can hear them mechanically skipping through my hall, running their weapons across the walls, chanting, We're here to cleanse the world. No toxic blood, my lord. It was so rhythmically unnerving. Just then, the silence is broken by the dispatcher, finally telling me police have been dispatched to my location. That's when I notice I couldn't hear the chanting anymore. I hoped and prayed that they had left. Maybe they got another guest. Maybe. Just then the doorknob begins violently rattling 
I start losing myself screaming and crying, and I hear officer so-and-so with the police department. I couldn't believe it. I asked the dispatcher and she confirmed an officer was on the property. I moved the furniture and opened the door. I was a wreck, understandably. The police called my boss and told her I needed the rest of the night off. And you know what she said? She said that if I left, I quit, regardless of circumstances. What a cow. Oh, and for the missing co-worker, she quit the next day. She said that she felt this job was going to kill her. This happened when I was 15, and my younger sister was 13, over three years ago. I always loved going trick or treating, because free candy. But I always hated being scared because I'm a total chicken. I don't mind someone jumping out from behind a car as I pass yelling boo. I can laugh about that afterwards. But I cannot handle anything further than that. Many parents will often tell their children that they can't go trick or treating after a certain age. But my parents weren't like that. They didn't care if we went and got ourselves some free candy as teens. They just stopped going with us. On this particular night, my sister and I were going down a street in our neighborhood that we'd never actually been down before, and all seemed well. Time was running out. Our feet ached from all the walking and our plastic grocery bags were getting heavy. A number of houses were turning their lights out at that point, but there were still several left and still a fair amount of people walking the street. As we neared the house, a dude wearing a pretty creepy costume jumped out from behind a car and scared us, then ran off to scare others in the same way. I didn't appreciate the scare, but knew he was just having his fun, so we went on and didn't think much of him. A few houses down the line, the guy who answered the door tells us that they've got no more candy, and the car guy is on us. I wasn't even aware the dude was anywhere near us. The car guy chases us away from the house, but then continues to follow us and starts asking us questions. This dude is clearly over 20, and we're barely 15 and 13. He's asking for our names and we don't respond. He then asks if we can join him, to which we tell him no, and to go away. I don't remember exactly how it all went down, but he just wouldn't leave us alone and his questions were starting to creep me out more and more. I kept telling myself that the guy was just trying to creep us out because it's Halloween and a lot of people find that fun, but I wasn't having fun at all. And I started feeling kind of unsafe. So I grabbed my sister's hand and we booked it to the next house that still had its lights on. Fortunately, the guy stopped following us after that. At that point, I was feeling pretty dumb with the whole experience. My feet ached, we had a good haul, and the lights were going out. There were starting to be less and less people on the street, and I was a bit shaken up. So I messaged my dad to go collect us at the stop sign where he dropped us off earlier, and we started making our way. About halfway to the stop sign, a small group of guys who might have been around 16 to 18 approached, complimented our costumes, and asked if we wanted a ride home. I quickly turned them down, already on edge from the car guy, and our dad was picking us up which I told them. They asked if we were sure, and I barely began to respond when I saw our dad's car and quickly said, yeah, no thanks, there's our ride. Perhaps I was just really paranoid and the car guy was still messing with us, and those guys just generally wanted to help. But I don't think a little paranoia is a bad thing, and I'm not ashamed to say that I'm suspicious of strangers. One thing is for sure though, I realized the downside of being a teen on Halloween night. People don't mind scaring the hell out of you and your parents won't be there to keep you safe if you do encounter someone with ill intent. That was the day I decided I was done with trick or treating. I have what I would call a guardian spirit. I've spoken to other people who've had experiences and while they've had something similar, it's not been to the degree that I'm living with. When I was 14, I was experiencing a lot of depression and anxiety due to family issues and drama. I was emotionally unstable and isolating myself from everyone. 
During this time, I believed something malicious attached itself to me. I began hearing something scratching at night. I could feel it touch me at night and would see a bulky figure as well. During this time, another entity made itself known. It would whisper my name, comfort me and awake me from nightmares. There was also one night I fell asleep crying and woke up in the middle of the night, holding my hands up in the air. I squeezed and felt substance. And when I looked to see who it was, it let go and my hand dropped. There was nothing. One night I felt it grab my shoulders and shake me awake. Sissy, wake up. I woke up to the malicious spirit sitting on my chest smothering me. I had to physically push it off. And afterwards it stood at the foot of my bed watching me. And I felt the guardian sit down next to me on the bed as the aggressive one dissipated. Eventually the malicious spirit was gotten rid of and the other one became very possessive over me. I haven't had many experiences with other spirits since I accepted its presence. I would often hear my name or sissy when I was alone or upset. At the very least, it's good to know there's someone watching out for me. I work in a hotel at the front desk. The hotel isn't very old, so you would normally not expect something strange or paranormal to happen. I sometimes work night shift. That means I'm completely alone. The first night when my colleague showed me how everything worked and what I had to do, she told me that we have some extra guests that never check out. Ghosts. She told me about the sliding door at the main entrance opening and closing by themselves. And she tells me that the sliding door opened and closed while no one was near it. But not only at that main entrance, but also the sliding door at the garage that kept opening and closing in the night with no one around. Not even the motion sensor caught anything. The light in the garage wasn't on, but still, I was kind of okay with it. I'm into spooky stuff and didn't have a bad feeling while it happened. But one thing did freak me out. All of the other stuff you could have just said was electronics. But one night I heard the elevator ding behind me. The elevator just makes that sound when someone on the floor presses the button. But as you can guess, I was alone. There was no one around. And the elevator opened and closed, but stayed on the same floor. I also took a look to see if perhaps someone was inside the elevator. However, it was completely empty. Once while going through the hotel as part of my job, I kept my phone recording the entrance. After that, I viewed it when I got back. Despite the fact my phone has bad quality, I did catch what sounded like a voice, a strange rattling sound. I thought perhaps it was just me, but you can't see anyone in the video. And if it was me, there should have been someone in the video, but there wasn't. Something that also happens often is that the light on the fourth floor keeps going on and off the whole night long. I can see it from the reception. I don't think guests are running around in the middle of the night. So it's pretty clear. There's something the motion sensors are picking up. I also saw some shadows in the corner of my eye, but I didn't see any proof as it's dark and I'm tired. I tell myself it could just be a trick of the light, perhaps my imagination. I have night shift again this week. I really hope that I don't see anything unnerving again. I'm a 19 year old female. And I went to a Greek island last May with my 22 year old cousin, also female as part of a trip. We liked to go on aimless walks out of the town that we stayed in to see what was around. On our way back from one of these walks, we were on a long narrow road that dropped off on each side to beaches. Beautiful. A small green car passed by us in the same direction that we were walking and stopped 50 to 100 yards in front of us, just sitting on the road. We say maybe they're just taking in the view. We continue to walk and when we finally get to the car, the passenger window is down, which happens to be our side, and the man is staring at us through the mirror. 
As soon as we pass, the car pulls forward past us again. Immediately after, the green car drives past us once more. A large truck drives past, again in the same direction, and pulls alongside the green car. They both stop for a moment and are clearly talking to each other. The green car speeds off and the black truck drives forward a bit more and stops on the same side of the road again. Keep in mind, we're on a narrow road. We can't turn around because town is the other way. Behind us is just beaches and a few houses. The black truck is stopped on our side of the road. And as we get closer, the driver opens the front and back door of the cab but does nothing else. Just stands there outside the truck mostly, looking back towards us. We decide this is way too sketchy. Both cars were clearly keeping an eye on us and watching and communicating. When we get closer to the truck, we nope off the road and drop to the beach. We get as far away from the road as the beach will allow us and start speed walking. The man from the truck crosses the road and watches us with binoculars from the side of the beach. We ran until we caught up with another couple and followed them back to town. I then saw the same green car driving back past us multiple times as we ran parallel to the road down the beach. We made it to our hotel safely, locked up and tied up our doors to the balcony and hallway. In a nutshell, I suppose I nearly experienced an aspect of the Taken movie for myself. But keep in mind, I would absolutely still recommend going to Greece, and this is an extremely unlikely and isolated incident. It's a beautiful place with so many wonderful islands to explore and some very sweet and lovely locals, by far the nicest people I've ever met. I've solo travelled a bit, and the world is actually not as scary as some make it out to be. The person who just broke the world record for youngest person to visit every country is a 21 year old woman, and she'll tell you the same thing. Anything can happen anywhere. Do your research, learn a bit of self defense, and always be aware of your surroundings. But always be open to new places too. About two years ago, I moved from my college town in Arizona to Woodland Hills, California for my new job. I was 21 and living alone in a studio within two blocks of an outdoor mall and gym. The apartments were older, built in the mid 70s, but were well maintained with a fencing cameras around the entire complex and gated entrances. It was a fairly nice area, mostly young professionals and families and it felt pretty safe. After this incident, I didn't leave my apartment complex alone after dark. One night I decided to take a walk after my workout. It was barely nightfall, and still fairly warm. I grabbed my water bottle and started walking past the gym in the opposite direction of my apartment. I walked for a little while, turned around and started walking home. That's when I noticed a white Escalade with completely blacked out windows that had passed me previously, passed me again. They drove down to the light and made the turn, so I thought nothing of it. Only when I saw the car for the third time did I start to panic. By this point, it was well past dark, and most people were heading home from the gym and the outdoor mall. I was still a few blocks from the gym and the car kept driving past, slowing down and speeding back up if they saw anyone around. I cut through a parking lot to try to get to the closest store open, a McDonald's. Before I knew it, the Escalade was back, and in the parking lot, between me and the McDonald's. The car started slowly circling the parking lot, and the windows rolled down part way to reveal three men in their 30s to 40s just staring at me. At that point I was frozen, and decided to stand under a light by a closed door while frantically trying to call my friends from the apartment complex to come get me. My mum, friends from other states, anyone so that I wasn't alone. The Escalade kept circling, slowing down to barely an idle every time they'd pass me. I saw the door of McDonald's open, and a younger guy came out, clearly done with his shift, and headed to his car. I started yelling for him to wait and that I needed his help, and took off running towards him. The Escalade sped out the parking lot, back to the nearest light, and turned again. 
I apologized to the younger guy for scaring him, and asked if he could please walk me to the gym, thinking the men were probably gone, and I could wait a few minutes there before walking back to my apartment. We made it to the gym, and he made sure I felt safe there before going back to his car. I waited for 10 minutes, still trying to reach my friend who lived in the complex, so he could come get me. I wasn't able to get a reply, so I called one of my girlfriends from back home and spoke to her as I did the walk the rest of the way home. I got past the main intersection before the car turned down my road and started following me again. My heart sank, and I had a horrible feeling that if I didn't get inside the gate before they got to me, I'd never be seen again. I broke into a sprint and screamed into my phone that I'm being followed and for my friend to not hang up. The gate had just started to close behind another resident's car and I barreled through it, sprinting the way back to my apartment and locking the door. After about three hours, I went to take my dog to go potty before bed, and out of curiosity or sheer stupidity, I walked back towards the gates I came through, still safe within the fence, and I saw the Escalade parked on the other side of the road, waiting just outside the camera's field of view. I calmly turned and walked my dog onto the interior apartment complex out of their sight. They came back to the same spot every night for several days, and after that, I never saw them again. This is something that happened several years ago. I was five or six. I used to go for lots of walks around my area. My neighborhood is literally against the back of a small shopping plaza. It has a grocery store, a pet smart, an outlet, and a couple of food options all in that lot. I was trying to get into better shape so I would walk about every other day and reward myself with a small meal and walk back home. I remember having a couple of creepy and weird things, like a dude pulled up in his truck once and was like, Hey, I think I know you. You look familiar. Do you want to ride? Uh, no thanks, buddy. Anyway, one day I had walked down the street a couple of blocks because a friend was supposed to meet me at Subway, and we were going to hang out for a bit. But he got caught up in family drama, and never showed. So, I grabbed a coffee from a nearby place and started walking home. As I got to the shopping plaza right next to my neighborhood, and was walking by the parking lot for the grocery store, I heard a guy calling out. I glanced over and there was a dude who looked like he was just putting groceries into his car, waving frantically and calling to me. I ignored him at first because I didn't recognize him and just assumed it wasn't me whose attention he was trying to get. However, as I continued walking, he seemed to keep trying to get my attention. So I kind of gingerly waved back and continued on my way. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him get into his car and I thought that was the end of it until he started driving along the parking lot at my pace. His window rolled down as he attempted to wave me over. I tried to ignore him and just walked faster towards home. When I got to where the sidewalk opened up, so people could exit the lot out onto the street, he pulled his car up in front of me blocking my way. There were a million things racing through my mind at that moment. As he rolled the passenger window down and grabbed onto my arm and smiled at me and said, Oh, I just wanted to tell you, you are so beautiful. And you have lovely hair. I just wanted to tell you how beautiful you were when I saw you walking. I thanked him nervously, and he let me go, rolled up his window and drove off. I know this one's pretty harmless, but I was so terrified. I think I was 22 to 23 then, and to add on, I am by no means the standard of attractiveness. I've always been decently overweight and kind of had acne and skin issues, so it really caught me off guard. He very much made me feel unsafe, and I hope to not meet him again. To many people, they might not appreciate just how creepy this encounter might be, but if it were to happen to you, I'm provoked. Who knows, you'd probably feel like how I felt.